Okay. So, so many things have happened. Um, you know, when, when we left you guys, I had graduated from seminary and we were going on this vacation to rest. Well, uh, none of that actually ended up happening. Well, we did go on vacation, but, um, we, when we arrived in Maui, um, Noble and I immediately for the first two days got, um, this horrible, um, food poisoning. So poor Noble, he was throwing up for the first 24 hours, um, like about 12 times. I mean, just, it was so hard. And then I ended up getting sick and poor Nicole was just trying to shove fluids down both of us. And, um, it was nice because the condo that we were staying at, um, is right on the ocean. The windows are right on the ocean. There's this emerald green right outside. So we would be super sick laying down, but we'd turn around and crack open our eyes and see this tropical paradise right outside of our window. So it was nice being sick there, but, um, and we were glad that we were sick in the beginning of the trip, um, especially as things turned out. So we we got uh, we gradually got better. We started to venture outside. Took a went on the beach one day. Took a trip to Lahaina that night, and then the next day we lost power because the wind was so strong. And we heard that there is this Hurricane Dora about 500 miles off the coast. That was causing these incredibly tough winds. We are staying about six or seven miles or so from Lahaina. And we lost power, but we still had internet. Um, and we were hearing chatter from the locals that were saying that the electric company, their, their power poles were infested with termites. And so the wind, it was just so easy to knock them down. And people were grumbling against the electric company, just saying, man, they should have had this stuff repaired by now. So it's wild to get power or back on. And there were some fires that had started, but not close to us in what they call the up country. And then another one pretty far away. But rumors were that those were under control and we would get power back at some point. We still had internet. But as the day progressed, we noticed that we were. And that day turned into that night. We were, we had um, gone to Lahaina the night before, ate dinner there, got some, some, um, some uh, little, you know, souvenirs. And that night we were there and um, we were, I was asleep and Nicole. We're losing you then, man. Oh, you're losing me. Tell me when I'm up and going again. You're back. I'm back. Okay. Um, so Nicole woke me up in the middle of the night um, saying the the gusts of wind are so strong. I'm concerned. Should, what what should we do? So I went out on the back porch to kind of see if the, if the waves were coming up over the seawall and they weren't. So I thought, I think we'll be all right. But then Nicole said, come out to the front porch and look at something. And we go out to the front and we look towards Lahaina and there's this incredibly bright orange glow. Um, and we, and we, it was so hot that we could see heat vapors right kind of doing this wavy, like rising up into the sky. And we were concerned and said, wow, that is a hot fire. That's, um, that seems intense. It, uh, what should we do? The wind was pushing it away from us. So we thought, man, we should just stay here. And if we need to evacuate, I'm sure we'll get a warning of some sort, but I think the best thing is for us to stay here. So back to sleep nicole uh she was she couldn't go back to sleep and the next day we went over to our friend's house we have uh, some friends that are there that let us use their condo as a graduation gift of their where they live is right across the street from this condo so we went over to our friend's house and we opened the door and there's families people evacuated people that they had let in 
and they're on air mattresses and sleeping all over the floor. And so they kind of said, yeah, the town Lahaina has been evacuated. And what was frustrating was we were getting all these texts from you guys um, saying, are you guys all right? We need a progress report. So you had more information than we did um, because we had no internet. And the frustrating thing is we could get texts, but for some reason we couldn't respond to tell anybody that we were okay. So our parents were trying to communicate with us. And um, I remember telling Nicole, okay, this has been such a big deal that they're hearing about it over on the mainland. I wonder how big of a deal this is. And nobody really knew. Um, the people that were there had just been evacuated. And we started hearing rumors that, okay, part of Lahaina has been burnt. And then it was, I think all of Lahaina has been burnt. And then it was, it's gone. It's not there anymore. And we started to realize that those rumors were true. The more we heard was where that was just the devastation of this fire. So Nicole and Noble and I, we were so humbled by the generosity and the selflessness of this family that we just thought, let's just jump in and try to help these guys out. Um, just support them, do whatever they need, clean, clean. Uh, help feed these families. There was no power. There was no water. There was no gasoline. There were no grocery stores. Uh, I mean, it turned into a third world type of a country overnight. Uh, parking lots filled with evacuees, just not able to go anywhere, not knowing where to go. Um, it was, it was, it was really intense. It was surreal. Um, people, I mean, just the grief, the trauma, people just weeping, tourists trying to get off and trying to leave in, in mass quantities. So we just jumped in and tried to serve this family. Um, so we would make runs to the store on the other side of the island and hope that they would let us back in. Um, my friend and I, they were saying that we'll let people out off of West Maui, but not we won't let people back in, resident or otherwise. They're just shutting it all down. So... We pleaded with the National Guard, my friend and I, that we had medications for elderly folks um, and to please let us back in. And they kind of, in a secret back way, let us, ba let us back in. We did that. And then at one point I had to take a family uh, or half of a family. There was a family of nine sleeping on the floor of this house. And they had realized that their house was, was preserved. Um, and they, found another place to stay, but they wanted to go back by their old house and get some of their belongings. And so, um, but they were going to ask, you know, Lahaina is shut down. The National Guard is all around it. Police are everywhere. They're not letting anyone in. There's looters on the inside. Plus there's, a, you know, just so many deceased folks um, in there. They're trying to be very careful. Well, this man and his family they were going to ask the police if they could get back in. I thought, ask. So he had half of his family in the car in front. I had five of his teenage children in the car with me. And we go up to the checkpoint and I hear him conversing with the cop in front. And he's ex trying to explain. I'm just trying to get some of my things. The police officer says, no, this man, not a Christian, says some rude, obscene things to the police and floors it through the barricade into Lahaina where he's not supposed to be. And <laughs> I've got five of his, and I'm thinking, okay, well, here we go. So I, I, I followed him and I went boom over this curb, through the grass, into some parking lot. And here we are in the middle of Lahaina going through and the National Guard stops us and or stops him in front. And I hear him just confess to this National Guard guy. He's like, yeah, I broke in, but here's the situation. And they actually let him go to his house. And so I followed him there and dropped them off, told them about Jesus, prayed for them and said, I'm going to leave now. So I got back in my car and got out and um, had to ask the police, hey, I don't want to to your to your burden but is there a safe way to get out of here and he was so nice and he told me how to leave but anyway they locked it down completely that night um so that's what we were doing the whole time it, i can't say it was restful
missions trip, I think, than it was, than it turned out to be a vacation. Um, and then we came back to Cal. We went to California to visit Nicole's folks and stayed a couple of days there. Uh, so nice. That was um, a really fun time. And then Noble and I flew here and then, you know, the rest of the story, Nicole got stuck. So it's been a crazy time. You know, we were thinking it was going to be a, a time to rest and, and a time to um, kind of regroup after a, a long haul of a, of a project of education to getting that done. But, you know, the Lord had other plans and we're just trusting him. that God knows what kind of vacation that we really need. We felt really honored to be there, humbled to be there, especially with this incredible family. Um, and I'll show you pictures of this family next week. Um, cause I would to consider if you're wondering where to donate, um, they would be a great family to donate to, and they would make sure, um, that our funds got to the, the appropriate places. Um, it's hard to know who is being responsible with money right now over there to be frank with you and even including churches so um, I trust this family um, anyways I'll let you know more information about them but they're just doing they're just being servants of Jesus uh, spending thousands of dollars of their own money to get food and to, and medication and diapers and formula for people um, so that they can survive and we were we just thought we just need to jump in and help um, thank you guys for your prayers. It, I was so hoping to be there in person. Um, but again, we're just trusting that God knows what he's doing and that he wanted it to be like this today. So uh, I'm here at home and I want to lead you guys through um, a, a, a study in the Bible. If you would turn to Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, we're going to read verses 19. 31. Um, and these are some things I've been chewing on. I'm, I'm also so bummed to miss the uh, Union Gospel Missions presentation today afterwards. The, those guys, you know, huge UGM fan and so excited to partner with them. It's just bummed that I'm not going to be able to be there. But I think this message will also help set them up for what they're going to do as well. Let me pray. Um, and then we're going to read from Luke. 19 through 31. Lord, um, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for technology. Thank you for our church and our church family. And uh, Lord, as awkward as this is, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us through this scripture now, that you would touch our hearts and that you would transform us with an experience of you, with a counter with you so that we can be all the more in love with you today. Thank you for the benefits of your kingdom. Thank you for your grace. And we ask that you would, I pray for Calvary Wallingford. I pray that you would um, help us grow and mature as we follow you. Lord, we've just got, I, I believe you've put such a burning vision and plan on our hearts for the months and years ahead for us to follow you closely and to be form more and more into your image. I pray that you would bless that and that you would give us the wisdom and the discipline to do it. Lord, I, I want to pray for the um, displaced people of Maui, um, of Lahaina. I ask that you would bring hope to that island. I, Lord, I pray that the, church, that the churches, that Christians, that your followers would be unified, would have um, a direction and a plan for how they can share um, your ministry and be your hands and your feet on that devastated place. Lord, I pray that you would be there um, in their midst, that you would incarnate yourself through your people into the ashes of Lahaina, those people's hearts. Lord, I also pray for Nicole today, that you would bless her with more time with her parents, that she would be able to get a little bit of vacation back and rest a bit. Um, and I just also thank you for us home safely in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. We still good. Everybody, everybody on the tech team. We're, we're, we're good. Okay. I see arms going up. It's weird. To, uh, also, yeah. It's weird to preach to my phone. 
Um, this is Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man, this is Jesus telling this, who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, who was covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sore. Well, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him away to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now in Hades, that is in hell, where in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. This is verse 25, if you're following. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime, you good things while Lazarus received bad things but now he is comforted here and you are in agony besides all this between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go to you can't nor can anyone cross over from there to us and he answered then I beg you father send Lazarus to my family for I have five brothers let him warn them so that not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they'll repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is God's word. Okay, um, the theme that Jesus talks about, especially throughout uh, Luke, but throughout all the Gospels, one of his main themes is this theme of the kingdom of God. And um, Luke shows Jesus approaching this subject from all sorts of different angles. There's really, it's a, it's a, because it's a massive idea. Um, there's no way to synthesize it or to distill it into like a, fortune cookie saying that just doesn't work because the idea is such a monster of an idea. Um, And it's not easy for us to understand what Jesus means by the kingdom of God, because we live in a democracy. Um, We, we, uh, we vote our leaders in. Um, That's not how it works. That's not how a kingdom is. In fact, just to start super simple, a kingdom, according to Webster's dictionary is a country, a state, or a territory ruled by a king or a queen, a realm associated with or regarded as being under the control of a particular person. So we know in our minds what a, what a, what a monarchy is, but it's hard for us to understand in, in our world because we're not our, we don't live in a territory that's ruled by one person or that's ruled by another. We live in a republic. A king is not saying, is not somebody that we vote in somebody we can petition. He is someone that we give or that the subjects give absolute obedience to. We don't really get to give him our opinion unless he asks for it. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be in the kingdom of God? What are the benefits of being in the kingdom of God? What does that mean? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. That's what Jesus is. He tells this brilliant story of what it means to be in his kingdom and what it looks like we get what people get from being in this kingdom. Um, and Jesus is talking about really, it really comes down to the heart of it. It's talking about an identity. Um, being in a kingdom, being in God's kingdom gives us a brand indestructible identity that can handle anything. Jesus is throughout the book of Luke is constantly talking about identity in relation to the kingdom of God. What does it mean to have an identity? What does that mean? Um, Simply, it's just to know who you are. It's to know who you are. But that's the simple kind of surface level idea of an identity. It really 
touches to these really huge ideas. Um, like what is a human being? What are we here to do? What's the purpose of life? Um, all of that is tied to our, uh, as tie our view affects who we are and what, uh, what we think of our identity, um, who we are, how valuable we are, what we're here to do. Um, things that philosophers have been debating for centuries and centuries and that there are different about. For example, we live in the Western world that basically says we are, we live in a world of Darwinian um, evolution in terms of our culture that basically says we have the luxury of making up our own meaning. We get to determine our own purpose. We get to decide what we want to be about. And therefore our, our purpose and our meaning is tied to imminent things, things that our philosophers call in our imminent frame. In other words, there's no transcendence that we can, um, there's no transcendent cause or no purpose outside the imminent world that we can um, anchor our purpose to. So therefore it's subjective. We all get to choose. And the problem with that is, as, as freeing as that can be, the problem with that is, is that there, um, it creates, well, for one thing, it creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. If all of our meaning and human purpose is upon our shoulders as a society, that it's a tremendous amount of, of pressure to create purpose and meaning ourselves. Um, I was just reading recently that our culture in the Western world, especially uh, the culture, the uh, generations that are coming up are the most anxious uh, citizens in modern history. Um, anxiety is at an all time high. Suicide is at an all time high. Society is unraveling in a lot of different ways. And a lot of that is because there's this pressure that's all on us that we make the world what we want it to be. Um, we were just watching a concert on TV, a live concert where the artist said, at, the, at my concert, I want you to be allowed to be whoever you want to be. And that sounds so beautiful and so freeing and so wonderful. And yet that's a tremendous amount of pressure to put on any human soul. Whereas Jesus, the Bible and, a lot, and most Eastern religions will talk about our purpose as humans anchored in a trans something transcendent send it something that's beyond us and that's really what jesus is getting at here and to get at that he tells this incredible story this brilliant story about two people and these two characters um when you, if you read it carefully they're obviously a study in contrast they contrast each other at almost every level i think really at every level one is rich one is poor um, one is covered in luxurious garments. That is the best clothing of his day. The other is covered in sores so that the dogs are even licking the poison or licking the, the pus that's coming out of his sores. One is feasting every day. Um, literally when it says lived in luxury in your Bible, it can be translating to feasting every day, eating out every day, the, the fanciest restaurants, the best of foods. Um, the other is starving, even longing for the crumbs um, so that, uh, you know, that are falling off the rich guy's table, but not getting any of those. And lastly, we're told that when they, um, they both die, the rich guy gets a tomb and by implication, a really nice funeral. And there's no reference to that for the other guy at all. It probably means that Lazarus, um, that he died on the street and was basically thrown into the ground by strangers. No one really cared or knew that he was alive or now dead. He was forgotten. And then in the afterlife, one is tormented and one is comforted. One loses everything and the other gains everything and gets everything. So the contrast here in the story couldn't be greater. It's obviously a feature that Jesus is trying to get us to pay attention to. But we can't miss the um, what Jesus meant to be the most striking con you just did, and we could talk about it, but I can't hear you at all. So I'll just say it. Um, maybe you've noticed one of these guys has a name, an identity, and the other one does not. Um, and that is by no 
accident or inconsequential at all. There's no way that this is an oversight on Jesus's part. And I'll tell you why. Every other illustration, every other parable, I'm using really big language here, every other story that Jesus ever, tell, ever tells, nobody, he gives no one a proper name. It's always uh, a sower, Matthew 13, or a shepherd, uh, John chapter 10, or a man or a woman, Samaritan or something, but never uh, does he give anyone a proper name nowhere but here. Here, one character is given a name, an identity, and therefore, this is really, really significant. The name Lazarus is a name that means God is my help. God is the one that helps me. So one character is given a proper name. The other one has no name. And what's the point of what are we being told? I think verse 25, I think the, the moral of the story is on Abraham's lips. Abraham replied in verse 25, son, he's talking to the rich man. Remember that in your time, you received your good things. In other words, Abraham is saying, you've made your choice. You've already made your choice. He's had his good things. See, we have two people who each built their identities, um, who they are, what they value, um, all of the, where they're going, all of those things, they built their identities on two different philosophies. And as a result, one has a name, an identity, or a true self, an indestructible self, and the other is left nameless. And basically, a Unlike Lazarus, Lazarus, who means God is my help, the rich man's help is now gone. And here, Jesus is so ahead of his time. He's speaking into eternity, especially to the Western world. He's basically saying, when you build your identity on things that life can, maybe this is too soon, but I think you'll get the point. Life can burn away. Um, life can blow it away with a hurricane. Um, life is so precarious in this imminent frame. Life is, it, it, there's not much here that we can depend on. And so therefore, if we build our identity, our sense of self and personhood and our soul, our psyche in the Greek, if we build that on things that a fire can burn up or that wind can blow away or that a flight can cancel or that technology can fail, then our identities fail. Our self is in jeopardy. We're left with nothing. That's the point. Here, the point isn't, isn't that the rich man, had, he's not necessarily attacking wealth. The point is that the rich man built his identity on wealth. His status was built on wealth. He had completely built his life on that. And now it was gone. It was gone. So what are we learning here? Here's what we're learning. The reason that the rich man doesn't have a name is because being rich was all he ever was. And now that's gone. In other words, if he didn't have riches, in his mind, he had nothing. He had nothing. He's built his life on his wealth. So now that his wealth is gone, his identity is gone. And if his wealth is gone, his name goes away. His purpose goes away. His character goes away. He has nothing left. If God is the but if God is the source that's in your life, then all the circumstances in the imminent frame in this world, all the circumstances, the things that you lose, the the things that you uh, or the things that you gain, there there's all different kinds of circumstances that you that you will go through in this life. Trust me, you know if I built my identity on a vacation, holy mackerel, wouldn't work. But if God is the source of my identity, there will always be a me. There will, if God is the source of your identity, there will always be a you in you. No matter what happens in the imminent frame, yourself will be there, no matter what your circumstances are, because the circumstances can no longer really touch your identity because it's anchored to something transcendent out of this world, and it makes you an incredibly resilient person. It makes you a tough person. 
even when you can't explain the circumstances of what, what's going on around you, you still know you're valuable. You still know where you're going. You have a sense of purpose and meaning that can't be touched by any kind of circumstances here. You can see how Jesus is saying, look, this is the good life. The kingdom of God gives you an identity that is indestructible, that can't be burnt up, that can't be blown away, no matter what. And the obvious example, the perfect example, in Jesus' brilliant story to get this across, is Lazarus. Lazarus had nothing, and yet he still had a self. He had a name. He had an identity. And Lazarus went through the most incredible, scary change of all, and that is death. He went through death, which is a very big change where you lose really everything. And yet at the, in eternity, he's still him. His self went into the transcendent and went into eternity. But the rich man is different. Why? Because he didn't have a name. Why not? Because he built his identity on things that go away. And when you do that, you're not just unhappy. You find out that there's no you. God forbid if you lose it all or if a fire burns it all down or whatever might happen. God forbid that you come out of an experience like that saying, I don't know who I am anymore. There's no me left. No wonder our culture is so anxious. No wonder our culture is so insecure. Um, it's so scary. All that pressure on us. That means... At the end of it all, when you, lose, when you lose things that are valuable to you, you don't feel valuable. You don't know what you're living for anymore. You don't even know who you are. And that's why Jesus is saying, if, if you build a self on anything but God, you really don't have a self. When you say you've lost everything, Jesus, God would say, well, yeah. So let me um, ask you a few pointed questions here, because I think... This is, uh, we have to ask ourselves this when we read God's word. Let me ask you this. Who are you really? Who are you really? Are you willing to go as deep? Are you church? Are you individual person that's listening to this? Are you willing to go as deep as this passage wants you to go and answer these kinds of questions? Do, do you have a name? Do we have a name? Do we have a self? Or are you... How do you identify yourself? Are you a mother? Are you a father? Are you in business? Are you an artist? Are you a musician? Are you an academic? Are you, what do you say? This is who I am. In our culture, we ask, what do you do? Here. I am, you know, whatever it is. And you say, well, what's wrong with any of those things? Nothing, really. Nothing at all in and of themselves. But the point is, if that's the main thing, the thing that you say, man, if I don't have this, then I'm nothing. If I don't have this, I can't be anything. Jesus here in this passage is saying that's literally true, unfortunately. That's actually true. Do you have a name or are you merely a father or a mother or a musician or an artist? Is there a you there? And Jesus is saying that's what the kingdom of God gives you. It gives you a self. That is, that is made in the image of God and that's planted in the heavenly places. Okay, secondly, notice that this identity is a continuation or your state of identity is a continuation into eternity. That of all the things that might change in the afterlife, your state of identity goes on. And last through it. Take a look at the second part of the story. Look at verse 23, and I think I can show you. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up. Okay. First of all, pause there, I guess. We, we probably should. Let me, this is, this is the Bible's controversial doctrine about hell. And I know it makes people in our world, including us, squirm. For We have different reactions to this word in our culture. And I think we'll probably see through this story. This story is so helpful because it shows us that many of our assumptions or thoughts about hell are typically wrong in a biblically sense, in a biblical sense. Some people say, yes, hell, I know about this teaching. This is one of the reasons a lot of people in our culture don't like Christianity or have left Christianity. Um, the idea, the whole idea of eternal 
sour taste for a lot of various reasons. And then there's those of us that say, no, I believe, I believe that because I was taught that that's what the Bible says. And I think that we're probably going to say that both reactions may not be exactly accurate here. Whether your understanding of hell is something that you've rejected or something that you've retained, um, it probably doesn't match the description here. First, look how stubborn, look at the stubborn ignorance of this rich guy in eternity. Look at verse 23 again. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so we called to him, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Okay. Now, what he's describing for Lazarus is the job of a slave. It's the job of a servant. Now, wait a minute here. The rich man used to be on top, and Lazarus was literally on the bottom. But in eternity, it's a completely different reality. Lazarus is on top. He's with Abraham, and the rich man is at the bottom. And yet, the rich man still can't see it. He's not enlightened in the afterlife. He still, he's kept his distorted view of reality even in hell. He's still ordering Lazarus around just like a servant. The rich man is still doing what? He's still clinging to his status, even though he doesn't have it anymore. He still thinks that he's the one on top. He's still clinging to his authority. He thinks he can order Lazarus around. This is deep eternal, stubborn denial of reality. It's astonishing how out of touch with reality this guy is, even in eternity. On the one hand, he can understand that he's in agony. He says that, I'm in great torment, he says. But on the other hand, he's absolutely blind to what is actually happening here. He still thinks he's in charge. He still thinks he's holding on to that old identity factor, his status and his position. So the first thing that I want you to see about hell is the stubborn ignorance. And this is actually consistent throughout all of the Bible. When the Bible gives us a kind of a window view into hell, what you don't see is people going, oh, if I just would have known. Or, oh, I'm sorry now. And God saying, ha ha, I don't care anymore. And, and you know kicking them further into the flames. That's not what we see. We actually see, especially in the book of Revelation, we see people say, I see that you're God and I still hate you. I still want nothing to do with you. There's the stubbornness going on. The second surprising thing is that he has the audacity to accuse. Look at verse 27. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Now, what's the implication here? What's behind this? He says, I've got a bunch of brothers and they're trampling all over poor people just like I did. You know what? They need a proper warning. They need better information. If they just know more, what's the implication? It's pretty obviously, it's pretty obvious. I didn't get a good enough warning in my life. I'm here because I didn't know. I didn't get better information. If I just would have had someone to come and warn me and tell me something that would have inspired me enough. In other words, he's saying, this is not my fault. I wasn't warned properly. You can see his ignorance, now his accusation. And last of all, and what commentators say, all commentators agree and say this is pretty interesting, see, is what he does not ask for. Notice what he doesn't ask for. What does he not ask for? He doesn't say, get me out of here. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't say, I'm sorry for how I treated people. I'm sorry for the way I lived my life. The implication is, especially with his request to send Lazarus to his brothers, the implication is that he doesn't really think he's guilty. He's, in other words, he's eternally unrepentant. He's re eternally unrepentant. This is the Bible's consistent description of people that end up away from God. Dinesh D'Souza and others have said the gates of hell are locked from the inside. 
Now, if you understand the idea of hell here, listen, hell is just your freely chosen false identity in repetition going on forever. That's a really great biblical description of hell. In other words, it's not compartmentalized that it happens after this life. It's actually, in a sense, you're you're partaking of it now. You're on a course now. And it's a continuation of how you're building your life, your inner self, your 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 psychology, your soul, your heart. It's where you're headed and it continues in that way. No one gets this across better than C.S. Lewis. He's written several things in several books like The Great Divorce, The Problem of Pain, The Screwtape Letters. All of these books have some amazing quotes on the subject. I just found one for you here that I thought does a really good job. This is Lewis. He says, in the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out past sins and at all costs, give them a fresh start? He has on Calvary, on the cross. To forgive them, but they won't ask for forgiveness. To leave them alone? Alas, I'm afraid that that, that is just what he must do. Hell begins, Lewis says, with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others, but you are still distinct from it for a long time. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could, st you could stop it. You know, man, I wish I wasn't so negative. I wish I wasn't so complaining. I wish I wasn't this. He goes on, but there will come a day when you can no longer stop it. If the hair on the back of your neck is not up right now, now's the time where you should command it to be that way. It is, this is eerie. Um, then there will be, he says, then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even to enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on and on and on like a machine. It is not a question then of God sending anyone to hell. In each of us, there is something growing up which will be hell unless with God's help it is nipped in the bud. I'm going to re read that last line again. In each of us, is something growing up which will be hell unless with God's help it is nipped in the bud. Jesus went in on this on the Sermon on the Mount where he, he kept talking about it's better to pull your eye out or cut off your arm or get rid of some appendage of your body rather than your whole body, your whole soma, your whole self to be thrown into hell. And what he's talking about is that, man, you'll experience hell and a lot of us are in some ways because we haven't nipped a habit in the bud. And that habit has become a character. And that character has become a defining, growing, gangrenous cancer that threatens to eat us up. For my first Sunday back, I thought I would, you know, something light, something easy. Do you see here? You can see it from our rich friend in the story. The things he used he used to cope in life didn't stop in eternity. Gosh, this is so scary. But they continued to consume him until there was no him left. And in this way, you can understand that having riches really isn't the problem. There are, in fact... We lost you again. Yeah. You... Ethan or someone to give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down. We're back. Shadow in. puppets, smoke single. Okay. For a second. We're good now. We're good now. Okay. Um, I was saying that this really shows that this is not about being rich or poor, really. It's about what we depend on. And there is science, there is there's research that shows that people who are mo the people who are most concerned are consumed and obsessed with riches are the people that are the most impoverished. They think if I just had that, 
that will make it that would make my situation better. And of course, it would improve it, no doubt about it. There's nothing wrong with, and we should look, strive for getting resources to the poorest groups of our people. But to build an identity on that, to say that that is the is not the problem. The problem is what we are using to cope in life will consume us. And here it's consumed until there's nothing left. Um, I can't help but think of Dickens in the Christmas Carol when Scrooge eats the ghost of his old miserly business partner, Jacob Marley. And he's covered in chains that are attached to boxes filled with treasures. And Scrooge says this, he says, said Scrooge trembling tell me why and here's what Marley says I wear the chains that I forged in life replied the ghost I made it link by link and yard by yard I girded it on my own free will and of my own free will I wore it in other words Marley is saying hell is what I forged in life is what I chose this is what Dante was getting at when he wrote and Juliet in hell. It's such a poignant picture of Romeo and Juliet are conjoined in hell. In other words, they got what they wanted. They Now they can't get away from each other. And in Dante, and arguing for eternity because they got what they wanted. They built their identity on love for each other, on obsession for each other, really. And that's, that's what they got. So this is how it works. Um, Romans 1 says that God eventually gives people what they want. What if the worst thing that God could do for us is just simply to give us what we want? That's what makes hell. That's why it's a tragedy to believe what most people believe about hell. You know, that it's this pit that's on fire and there's people thrown into it and crawling up saying, please let me out. And God just the lid and laughs and says it's too late two things are though that image of hell is repugnant to the gospel first of all because no one according to the bible no one is in hell saying let me out and second god is not laughing his heart is breaking when you see jesus come to jerusalem in, in luke 19 that's what you see you see him pleading with people his heart is broken so the first thing we see is that living in the kingdom us an indestructible identity it makes us tough it makes us be able to handle anything and it's the only kind of identity that will endure into eternity um that will will keep going the right way through eternity but there's something else it's an identity that has a completely different set of values completely different in other words the kingdom gives you an entirely different way of evaluating yourself and also looking at others, evaluating other people. Let me show you what I mean. At verse 14, this is the context of the entire story that Jesus tells. In verse 14, it says, The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. In other words, this is the view of eternity. Things are flipped. This is that Jesus constantly describes the kingdom of God as kind of like an upside down kind of kingdom where value systems are completely flipped. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And everything that people value is, is an attempt to justify self. In other words, it's self-salvation. That's the context of the story. And Jesus is telling this to the Pharisees because he sees that they're building their sense of self on the love of money. He tells them that they are trying to save themselves. They're self-justifiers. You're, a, uh, In other words, money is what you're using to justify yourself. This is your identity. And the, here's the implication. The implication is that there is such a thing as being God-justified versus self-justified. See, an identity that's self-justified is based on your accomplishments, how much money you make or or what you've what you've done or your reputation or whatever it might be. 
And it's based on something besides God, basically, that you've achieved. But then there's God, uh, a God-justified self, which is not based on your accomplishments, but based on God's grace. And therefore allows you to practice the way of Jesus in a way that that um, works your identity out into the into your, the muscle memory of your body. That's what we're going to start going into of our church. That the things that we can do, not to earn our salvation, but to participate with the salvation that we already have, that will work the way of Jesus into muscle memory, into the way we do the world around us. Now, Jesus gives gives them in this parable the way to know what your identity really is. There's a a litmus test that you can take. Wouldn't you like to know? How do you know what your self is built on? Um, How do you know if you have a justified identity or a God-justified identity? And the answer is, according to this text, how we treat people who are less fortunate than us, how we treat the poor. How we look at others. Not just how you treat the poor, because Jesus says, what you find honorable, God finds detestable. And what you find detestable, God finds honorable. There's this reversal of values. So, for example, if you, um, if you hate lazy people, let's just switch it from wealth to laziness. If you hate lazy people, if you abhor a lazy person, it's not just because you hate lazy people, but it's because your hard workingness is your identity. I'm a hard worker. Therefore, you're going to despise people that don't work as hard as you perceive that you would. And the same goes, go back to wealth. There are people who are poor that despise the wealthy. And it shows that they're just as controlled by wealth as wealthy people are. Um, And there are wealthy people who Don't build their identity on wealth. God has just blessed them with wealth and they use it as a tool to love God and to love other people. So wealth or having it or not having it, not the issue here. If you're a hardworking person and you're um, grace justified, if you're justified by God, then you'll be sympathetic to lazy people. You won't see them as any different than you in their core, at their core. But if you're self-justified, you'll despise them. And you can apply that formula, I think, to anything. Why, When you're uh, driving and you get road rage, when you look at a political party and you get mad at them, um, if you have a strong political view, if you're either a conservative Republican or a liberal Democrat and you see your opponents not just as wrong, but maybe you see them as despising i've heard several people say um this can be republicans what does that tell you it says you're getting your self-worth from that your politics are causing your justification you're being self-justified you can apply this formula really to anything you see god honors the things the world doesn't and what does he despise only one thing he despises despisers He judges the judges because it shows that we're trying to get our our sense of identity from something other than him. Even if you're a moral person. Look, I'm glad you're a moral person, that you do the right thing. That's good. But if you feel superior to who you think are immoral people, if you feel disgusted by people or or who you think have failed morally or you see them as weak, um, and you feel that you're strong or whatever, um, you're using your own morality to justify yourself because Jesus came to save moral failures. He loves them. He loves them. So if you are a God just of the poor, all kinds of poor, morally poor, financially poor, mentally poor, you will try to serve and love all mankind. But if you are a self-justified person, you will despise them. And even when you go to help them, you'll feel better about yourself and you'll, you'll despise them even more. In other words, love for sinners, love for moral failures, love for other races, love for even people that believe in other religions, love for different political views, Love for uh, gender dysphoria and all of that confusion that's going on. Love 
is an inevitable, not agreement, but love is an inevitable sign that you are a sinner saved by grace and that you understand that. If not, then we're even using Christianity as a system to save ourselves and we have an eternally unstable identity. Lastly, how do we get this? How do we get into this, this identity? Now, we're doing good time-wise. You guys should have me teach by Zoom more often. And I won't even have to change out of my pajama pants. Um, I hope you guys are laughing. I can't hear laughter, but in my head, you're roaring with laughter. Okay. At the, at the very end, Jesus says, Abraham, have a dialogue with this man. Um, he tells Abraham, I know what it would take for a person to escape all this. And Abraham says, no, you actually don't. Abraham says they must listen to Moses and the prophets. That would basically be the Bible for first. For, this is Jesus's Bible, the, the Torah, the law and the prophets. This would be the canon of scripture in Jesus's day. He's saying, look, they, they must listen to Moses. This is how you don't get it. This man is asking for his brothers to basically have an emotional experience. His formula plus inspiration should e plus maybe willpower will, will equal transformation. And Jesus is saying, no. He's saying if something spectacular happened where dead people showed up, it was so inspiring where dead people showed up to warn them. They would be so freaked out and maybe emotionally inspired that that would kind of be like uh, it shock them back to life type of a thing. Put the fear of God back in them, scare them. Then they'll get religion. But Abraham flatly says, Jesus through Abraham says, it doesn't work like that because you'll never have an identity change through fear. You'll never have an identity change through an emotional high, you know, that I was a youth pastor for most of my career. And one of the most frustrating things of, of the youth ministry in the West is that we create these emotional highs. We take kids on retreats and we provide this incredible music and it's an amazing thing. And it's very emotional and kids give their hearts to Jesus and all of these things. And then there's like an 80%, um, what, what are they calling it now? Uh, deconstruction rate. Most young people leave the church. And I think part of the reason is because we've created a model of emotionalism that what we think maybe will, you know, they'll be so impressed by what goes on around. But here, Abraham says flat out, that won't work. Jesus is actually saying, well, here, let me just point something out to you here. Uh, Abraham says, even if someone rises from the dead, and what's interesting is Jesus uses a little Greek word here that is only used in his own rising from the dead later on in the story. Jesus is actually saying, even if you were standing outside my tomb and you saw the stone rolled away and I came out and you saw where my hands had been pierced and all of that. And you say, wow, it's incredible. He must be divine. He must be supernatural. He's saying that won't actually transform a life either. Isn't that something? What does he say? He says, you need Moses and the prophets, the wisdom literature of a life of practice, of practicing the way of Jesus, of practicing the way of Yahweh. That's what tells you why I rise, rose from the dead. It, now, don't get me wrong. The resurrection of Jesus is the, there is no Christianity without it. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm right there with Paul that said we are the most to be pitied if Jesus did not raise from the dead. And I don't think Jesus is trying to say that his resurrection is insignificant or unnecessary. That's not it. He's saying, but if it's not coupled with a life of listening to the word of God, of knowing the story behind the resurrection that led up to the resurrection of why we need Jesus, the perfect human, to go to pass through death and raise on our behalf. If we don't understand that, then we're not going to be able to raise from the dead in our practical lives either. We're not going to be able to live a life of resurrection, of transformation. 
We need Moses and the prophets. That's what, what tells us why. Just to see it won't change your identity. You need more than inspiration. We need transformation. We need to practice the way of Jesus. Why do you so desperately want all of those things? Why do we want to be transformed? Well, why do we want an identity in the first place? Well, because we're looking for love. It was the Lord's, this is Isaiah 53. Let me read this to you. This is so powerful. It says, it was the Lord's will to crush his son. Think about that. It was the Lord's will to crush his son. This is the prophets. This is what gives us context. And we looked upon him and we were appalled. He was disfigured beyond human appearance. And his form was marred beyond human likeness. The Lord made him a guilt offering. Listen to this. But the result of his suffering, at the result of his suffering, he was satisfied. That's Isaiah 53. Okay. Meditate on this last statement. He went through all of this. He was disfigured. He was beaten. Couldn't even recognize him as a man. Pilate, John tells us, had to tell the the mob. Hold the man. In other words, they couldn't recognize him. Yeah. We've lost just that last about 15 seconds. We can say that again. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. The, uh, I'll read the last part of Isaiah. The Lord made him a guilt offering, but the results of his suffering, he was satisfied. In other words, Pilate, he was disfigured. He was beaten up. Pilate had to signify who he was. John tells us that when Jesus came out after, father the sins of the world were laid on Sorry, he took it we lost you again there okay tell me when it's tell me when it's go time do can you hear me now yeah it seems okay good. okay um interesting right when we get to the gospel part um but out of all that, he's separated from his father. He takes on all of our sins. The results make it. That's what it means. When he sees the results of his suffering, it's worth it. He says, I, I'm glad I did it. What are the results of his suffering? Precious people, it's you and me. Think of that. When God looks at Mike, he says, I'm glad I did it. It was worth it. When God looks at you, on the cross, Jesus lost himself in a sense. And yet when God looks at you and the identity that he gives you, I'm glad I suffered. I'm glad I gave my son. I'm satisfied with this exchange. I hope you feel loved, you guys. I hope you feel eternally loved by that. And that love gives you an identity. The fact that our kids know, no matter what, no matter what my grades are, no matter what or good, at the end of the day, my dad, my mom love me. You know what you're doing? You're giving them an identity that can't be touched. That even when you perish, even when you go, when you are cut off, remember, my mom, my dad love me. God is giving us that, a paternal love that is transcendent, that goes outside the imminent frame, that says, like he said to Jesus when he was baptized, you, beloved son and daughter in whom I am well pleased. Nothing can touch that. 
oh, it's my prayer. I'm just talking to my phone, but it's my prayer that you go and sense how deeply, eternally, unchangeably loved you are and how that makes you somebody special forever. That gives you an identity that can't be touched, that can't be burned away or blown away or taken away by anyone, not even by yourself. My dear friends, the church that I love, would you? I'm challenging you to decide to believe it. Would you believe it? Would you decide, I'm going to believe that about myself, who I am. I'm a loved child of God, no matter what. It is 1140. I think a miracle has happened. Um, let's pray. And then somebody there is going to lead you all in communion. But let me pray. And then we'll finish out and get ready for um mission, especially how we can see these others, um, some by product of their own mistakes, some by victims of the system, whatever it might be, we can see them and love them as love people. by Lord, thank you for loving me that sickness can't take that away, that distance can't take that away access to my church can't take that away my identity in you is secure and strong and immutable it on that cross for us all we ask you to bless the rest of this service and the union gospel mission as they as they teach us more in jesus name amen i love you guys I don't even know if you can hear me anymore, if I don't even see you anymore, but I love you guys. And I'm so excited, hopefully, to be with you in person next week. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike.